Good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to the ninth uh, master class of the Jaipur uh, Surgical Tutorial on the topic of uh, abdominal tuberculosis. Jaipur Surgical Tutorial is an online educational activity which was initiated uh, about three years ago uh, by my new institution, the Mahatma Gandhi Medical College and Hospital in Jaipur in India. And uh, the activities of JST have been managed by my colleague, Dr. Anand Nagar, who's an associate professor of HPV surgery and liver transplant at my new institution. As a regular uh, activity of JST, we conduct a teaching session every Saturday, 9 to 10 a.m. India time. In addition, uh, we have recently started an afternoon activity because the morning activity was not uh, possible to be attended by colleagues in Africa. So on their request, we started uh, uh, Jaipur Surgical School, uh, which is every Friday, 3 to 4 p.m. And uh, this is being looked after by my colleague, Dr. Piyush Varshne and Dr. Kalash Kudia. Dr. Piyush is my former fellow from SGPGI, who is at uh, Ames, Jodhpur. And Kalash also is my former fellow from SGPGI, who is currently at Ames, uh, New Delhi. Uh, <clears throat> in addition, uh, we conduct these uh, master classes, which are once in a month, last Thursday and Friday of the month, uh, 7 to 9 p.m., where we discuss uh, one topic in two parts. And the previous sessions have been held on uh, safe cholecystectomy, living donor liver transplant, acute pregnancy, chronic pancreatitis, intensive care, uh, care of a critically ill patient, and uh, several other topics. Um, in between, I will be giving information about how to join Jaipur Surgical Tutorial and the Jaipur uh, Surgical School and how to join the future master classes. I will also inform about our annual academic activity, which is called Jaipur Surgical Festival. We've already had three uh, sessions in last three years and this year will again be on the first weekend of December which is 6 to 8 December 2024 and the theme this year is complications in uh, surgery. Also I am very happy to inform that uh, for uh, these activities now to very senior uh, surgical colleagues Dr. Sita Ram who was earlier the chief of HPB surgery at CMC Velour. Uh, he has agreed to join our sessions. He's uh, joined today's session also. Welcome, Dr. Sitaram. And Dr. Piyush Sani, who recently retired as the chief of GI surgery from Ames, New Delhi. And he was also the president of the Indian Association of Surgical Gastroenterology and the currently continues to be the editor of the National Medical Journal of India. Uh, he also has agreed to join uh, our uh, online educational activities. For uh, uh, this uh, masterclass topic is abdominal tuberculosis, where I am joined by uh, two of my uh, young colleagues who were again uh, my fellows at SGBGI earlier, Dr. Sasmal and Dr. Saurabh Galoda, who have contributed to uh, some of the chapters that we have written on abdominal tuberculosis. Another uh, a colleague of mine who has worked with me on abdominal tuberculosis is Dr. Muhammad Ibrarullah, uh, he uh, could not uh, join as a uh, panelist uh, because of uh, the Ramadan month going on, but he said that if he's free, he will join in between. So if he joins, I'll request him also to make uh, some comments either uh, today or tomorrow. So with that brief introduction of our uh, online educational activities, I hand it over to Dr. T.D. Yadav, who's going to moderate uh, the sessions uh, today and tomorrow. Dr. Yadav is the... Professor of uh, Surgical Gastroenterology at uh, Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education and Research in uh, Chandigarh. Uh, so over to you, TD, to start uh, today's proceedings. So uh, good evening, sir, and uh, thanks. Uh, we always uh, we are indebted to you to start these uh, academic activities which are uh, being run, and uh, I, I I come to know that uh, people, so many people from all over the world are joining and taking benefit from this academic activity. So as uh, Sir has introduced, this is abdominal tuberculosis uh, today and tomorrow. And uh, the first uh, 
My talk is to be given by uh, Dr. Prakash Sasmal, who is a professor uh, of uh, surgery at uh, Bhuvaneswar, Alina Institute, Bhuvaneswar. So he is going to talk about uh, abdominal tuberculosis, uh, when to think of the abdominal tuberculosis. And uh, uh, Dr. Prakash, uh, please start. Then uh, we will give our comments at the end. Uh, please go ahead. Good evening, sir. Good evening, esteemed faculty and uh, dear colleagues. Uh, with due respect to my mentor, Professor Kapoor, uh, I will be today trying to do justice on this topic because majority of the uh, audience present over here must have definitely got the experience of dealing a patient or many patients of abdominal tuberculosis. It's a nightmare, definitely. So, abdominal tuberculosis uh, clinical presentation I'll be trying to cover up. Then when to think of tuberculosis, something I'll try to catch. So greetings uh, to all of you from All India Institute of Medical Science, uh, Bhuneswar. Let me first go to a clinical scenario as a set induction. And this is a real case scenario. A 42-year-old male was admitted to the emergency with a history of recurrent generalized abdominal pain, fever, night sweats, anorexia, and weight loss over one month. He provided no history of close contact with tuberculosis patients, although he had a history of chronic recurrent cough. On clinical evaluation, there was a mal uh, he was malnourished, distended abdomen, and oil filled with generalized mild tenderness present all around the uh, abdomen. Radiological evidence of intestinal obstruction was there with multiple air fluid level with a suspicious IC junction mass near the IC junction as was evidenced and the air fluid level was till the IC junction. So this is the usual scenario you will be getting measured with the patients in the emergency setup. Besides this, you also will be encountering cases who will be coming with the dire emergency like perforation peritonitis and several others. So we used to think whenever we do not have any diagnosis with us, no diagnosis with us, we are confused. Is it really a mass in the uh, IC junction area, malignant mass, or is it a Crohn's disease, which is although not that common in India, ulcerative colitis, original ileitis, or even if there's tiflitis. So we usually ascribe that, is it a tuberculosis we are messing up? So that is the commonest diagnosis where no common diagnosis could be made. So it is very confusing in the very beginning to state. So these are the few of my operative photographs in case of this uh, surprises which we got in the emergency while operating. So in one of these condition, you can see the uh, mesentery is just, uh, it was thickened and mesentery lymph nodes were there. There was a stricture at the IC junction area and it was suspicious to be malignancy, but the patient was young around 30 years without any history of uh, significant weight loss and no history of even contacts with tuberculosis patient. So it was very confusing. Ultimately, we had to land up with a limited hemicolectomy as it was not a mass lesion, only the uh, lip nodes and it was a stricture type. So it was highly suspicious of tuberculosis. And the other one you can see, we could not simply open the abdomen. This was a case of a cocoon, but the patient was in intestinal obstruction. To give a chance in the emergency, we operated, but in when we only closed the abdomen. The other one you can see, if you are lucky enough, you will be getting a transparent membrane type occasionally in patients where the patient present with intestinal obstruction, but you will be finding this type of membrane there with a segment affected and you will be taking it out or you will be doing adicialysis sometimes and sending some of the lymph nodes or the if resected excised specimen for the histopathological report, then you may be lucky to get a evidence of tuberculosis. With this brief introduction, I'll be trying to cover up what is abdominal tuberculosis brief overview of the disease and clinical presentations because without knowing the myriad of the symptoms or about the different presentations of the abdominal tuberculosis, it will be futile exercise just to uh, ponder around the clinical presentations. So abdominal tuberculosis, friends, is a chronic granulomatous disease caused by micro aerophilic bacteria, which we were taught in the microbiology, medicine, and number of uh, again, gynae and surgery. So all the textbooks will be definitely making a comment about tuberculosis. But abdominal tuberculosis, basically, you will be dealing with when you are a surgeon, mostly. And includes a tuberculosis infection of the GI tract because this microbacterium tuberculosis can affect from the esophagus right till the anus. 
so no gi tract is immune for development or resistant for the emergence of this uh, tuberculous bacilli so mesenteric lymph nodes yes after this gi tract is involved they may also involve the mesenteric lymph nodes and thereafter caseous necrosis and there can be addition in one of the case we found intestinal obstruction we will we went inside we found a pocket of pus with the segment of the bowel adhered over there and when we opened up it was a pocket, pocket of pus and it was sent uh, some caseous uh, necrosis type was suspected sent for biopsy came out to be tuberculosis peritoneal tuberculosis yes another entity where there can be diffuse again this uh, just like metastatic lesions you will be finding throughout the peritoneal cavity white white caseous necrosis or white white just metastatic lesions like uh, will be studied throughout the peritoneal cavity this will be highly confusing with that of the again malignancy so tuberculosis of the gi tract if we try to focus now you will be thinking that most of the cases of this uh, abdominal tuberculosis are secondary to pulmonary tuberculosis is it so not really only 15 to 18% of the patients with abdominal tuberculosis have active pulmonary disease and only up to 25% of the patients will have some radiological evidence that they are having probably some old head lesions or calcifications suggestive of a old uh, tuberculosis which uh, just uh, symptomatically got cured or got uh, again controlled now a fraction of the extra pulmonary tuberculosis that manifest in the gi tract intestinal tuberculosis accounts for only 2% of the uh, tuberculosis globally roots of the spread if we see intestinal tuberculosis we all know it spreads from the swallowed sputum in case of active pulmonary tuberculosis mycobacterium bovis from the unpasteurized milk ingestion also causes the intestinal tuberculosis from intestinal tuberculosis the disease or the micro organism can spread to mesenteric nodes and also to the peritoneum causing again those symptoms because of the peritoneal dissemination or the lymphadenopathies hematogenous spread yes also noted and lymphatic spread also noted so it has been also stated that this intestinal tuberculosis can be also uh, carried on this bacteria from the active pulmonary lesions from the pulmonary side by means of the hematogenous or the lymphatic spread event and directly also spread from the adjacent organs can do occur also in case of females you will be knowing that the uh, tubo or uh, ovarian organs are also affected and there can also include the peritoneal cavity so multiple routes of this uh, infection can occur now pathology and pathogenesis if we see mycobacterium tuberculosis infected sputum we discussed ingestion we discussed hematogenous and lymphatic we discussed all these are trapped in the pair patches that is the logic of again ileocecal tuberculosis which we will be knowing and the the residents joining over here ought to know about it so they can affect our lodge in the ileocecal region causing ileocecal tuberculosis or they can cause again transverse mucosal ulcerations or they can cause mesenteric lymphadenopathies now the ileocecal region is commonly involved in tuberculosis due to the following reasons why 80 to 90% of the cases of this abdominal tuberculosis are concentrated in that region we all know this year the common questions asked so rich lymphatics in the pear patches yes the presence of a neutral media favors the growth of the organisms and the presence of ileocecal valve precipitates stasis for the mycobacterium to grow and also gets absorbed in that region so these are the few of the conditions why there is a uh, frequent predominance of the ileocecal tuberculosis comparison of the two forms of the intestinal tuberculosis it is very common we all know and that is ulcerative variety and the hyperplastic variety but we should know that the ulcerative variety will be found in almost 60% of the cases so those patients will be having a very poor resistance that is the immunity is poor in those patients whereas the hyperplastic variety which often we tell that the differential diagnosis of a malignancy in the ileocecal region is the tuberculosis is present in only 10% of the patients so that is most commonly due to the ingestion of the mycobacterium bovis from unpasteurized milk intake and that will be also affected in the ileocecal region will be confusing with again uh, malignancy but the immunity if we see is good in the patient that is why that's a hyperplastic variety and the rest 30% if we see is a ulcerative proliferative type or a hyperplastic type or a fibrotic type which often or very often confuses with that of malignancy event 
modes of presentation if you see as i told you in the very beginning when you could not think of any diagnosis clinically then you think of tuberculosis are we missing it yes the modes of presentations can be acute or it can be chronic or subacute or acute on chronic in the emergency mostly we get acute on chronic but most commonly we get a chronic or a subacute condition that means patient will be having all the vague symptoms as will be described later on now challenges in the diagnosis median time from symptom onset to diagnosis takes around 4 months because the patient will be confused and will be confusing the physician attending physician or the surgeon who really what is the diagnosis so it's an indolent disease symptoms develop slowly over time the symptoms of the abdominal tuberculosis are often non specific such as fatigue weight loss and abdominal tuberculosis most often presents with complications like intestinal obstruction or fistula formation which can overshadow the underlying tuberculosis infection and delay the diagnosis so with this the clinical symptoms mostly found and in the literature which i found is that abdominal pain is the most common symptom with dull vague or the colicky type of pain if at all there is a subacute or acute intestinal obstruction others are the there is a alteration of constipation with diarrhea usually in case of malignancy on the left side we find constipation on the right side we find mostly anemic fissures but if there is a alteration of this bowel habit maybe diarrhea and sometimes constipation then think of a tuberculosis non specific symptoms like fever sometimes fever is or evening rise of temperature there can be excessive flatulence or there can be noisy sounds in the abdomen because of the subacute obstruction or adhesions and the patient will be telling that always the my abdomen is making a noise or sound and there can be abdominal distension for which the patient may be also seeking the help of a physician or a surgeon's attention due to ascites or subacute intestinal obstruction weight loss is very common of course because of the disease itself and also because of the poor appetite and because of the again weight loss and also the patient is also having this uh, uh, intermittent obstruction so there will be malnourishment as in case of pulmonary tuberculosis so the general symptoms if we see fever night sweats weight loss anorexia malaise and fatigue but nothing will be just clicking uh, in your mind is it all because of tuberculosis because you will be thinking fever okay let me rule out some uh, medical causes and night sweats is it a lymphoma are we dealing with weight loss anorexia and uh, uh, loss of appetite maybe are we dealing with malignancy so based on the clinical acumen experience and the patient's age and if at all you are lucky then any exposure to tuberculosis patient may give you a hint towards a abdominal tuberculosis or fox abdomen abdominal symptoms if we see most common symptoms are abdominal pain and other symptoms are abdominal mass or lump altered bowel habits gi bleeding up to 20% of the patients but uh, they will be only mild bloating or borderygmy as i was depicting and acute abdomen yes we will be finding those group of patients in the emergency that means with perforation yes intestinal obstruction or pyoperitoneum at times and those group of patients do have a morbidity and also increased mortality because really you cannot do a lot if there's a cocoon also associated with so clinical signs if we see patients are either malnourished pale abdomen will be just mild Uh, uh, mild generalized tenderness often distended with visible intestinal peristalsis distended bowel lobes dowy abdomen in case of peritoneal involvement or a cocoon formation rolled of omentum may be palpated as a mass or a mass in the right iliac fossa or the lumbar region or loculated ascites etc all clinically detected so one third of the tuberculosis patients present as acute abdomen we should not forget that due to intestinal obstruction and perforation peritonitis so a pertinent history clinical history is important perforation occur in the dilated bowel loop proximal to the stricture for the post graduate one need to remember it so common confusion will be with other gallbladder disorders like crohn's disease arthritis or fungal infections but most commonly in our scenario will be a malignancy so criteria for the diagnosis of abdominal tuberculosis are not going into a microbiological aspect when you are confused then the postions criteria one should remember if any of the four criteria are positive diagnosis is established that means a histopathology or a operative finding suggestive of tuberculosis or lymph node or a tissue positive for fb staining or a tissue culture reveals mycobacteria among these any of them will be positive means it's a case of pox abdomen you are dealing logan further modified the postions criteria by adding to it the response to att as a criterion even so it is often also practiced nowadays if you are not getting any hint then probably att 
or empirically started, if responding, then probably it's a case of tuberculosis. So it's one of the case where we did a limited excision of the intestine, later on came out to be a Gallnotter's disease and tuberculosis, and the patient uh, was given ATT. So friends, to conclude, abdominal tuberculosis requires a high index of suspicion as I depicted, and consider tuberculosis in patients with unexplained symptoms. Early diagnosis is crucial, definitely, for the better management of the patient. So thank you all for your patient behavior. Uh, thank you, Dr. Uh, Prakash. Uh, uh, very nicely you have covered the area, but uh, there are um, there are certain uh, areas uh, 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 you have uh, probably uh, taken luminal only. So uh, can you give some comment about solid organ tuberculosis uh, uh, presentation and uh, any 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 way to diagnose uh, solid organ tuberculosis in the abdomen? Yes, sir. Definitely, sir. Solid organ, uh, I did not touch up here intentionally yeah. because solid organ, especially in the liver, pancreas, kidney, yes, you'll be getting. And to the urologist, definitely this uh, uh, tuberculosis of the kidney is an entity which is frequently referred to the urologist and they do manage it. And uh, in the liver, they will be just ascribing as if it's a case of a uh, metastatic lesion or sometimes abscess in the liver and along with the systemic signs may be present. So they will be confusing mostly with a metastatic lesion. And there can be also abscess formation in the central necrosis occurs and abscess formation. And they can also lead to just like a, any pyogenic liver disease, they will be manifesting. Pancreas also in the case, uh, several case reports and series also, pancreatic tuberculosis has been also reported, sir. Yes, nicely stated, sir. About Actually, uh, D -D, uh, yes. uh, recently, Dr. Piyush Varshne, he has done with me a review on HPV tuberculosis. So I have requested him to make a small five-minute presentation tomorrow before we start the open okay. house session. So he will be covering this topic in little more detail uh, tomorrow. Okay, okay. Please. The HPV. So one, uh, one more important point we see that uh, there is a fold tuberculosis in the abdomen or there is a luminal. And uh, it is also, um, uh, as, uh, it has been found that combination uh, type of tuberculosis is rare, less than 10%. So one, once you are finding a, uh, so because sometimes when there is a luminal, there is a stricture, it is very difficult, uh, as you suggested, that um, uh, there are so many differential. And uh, if endoscope is not able to reach that area, and the people will start uh, ATT, thinking that in this country, uh, tuberculosis strictures are commoner. However, um, uh, there are lymphoma, there are, uh, uh, there are other uh, strictures uh, which, uh, which sometimes are uh, sur surprised once there is a surgical resection. So to, to, to have a little bit more uh, area, uh, more discussion about that, so it has been found that lymphonotuberculosis and uh, stricture if 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 you are finding so called tevis mesenteric or lots of lymph node tuberculosis lymph nodal uh, disease and uh, at the same time you are finding stricture or ulcerative cup part also so it this combination would be a little bit rarer so it we should we must think about other uh, other uh, uh, differential diagnosis uh, uh, rest of the points i think i uh, have been covered sir you want to say something yeah. So at the cost of repetition, I would like to reiterate some points which uh, Dr. Sasmal has made. One is that at least in our uh, patients and in countries uh, where tuberculosis still continues to be common, in every patient who has either an acute or a long-standing abdominal problem, tuberculosis has to be kept in mind as one of the differential diagnoses. That is very, very important. Second is... When the diagnosis is not fitting in with the malignancy, then again, you should think whether it is tuberculosis. Because you see, if it is malignancy and if it is widespread, obviously not much can be done for the patient except to establish the tissue diagnosis and give some definitive palliative or uh, chemotherapy. But if it turns out to be tuberculosis, it is treatable. It is completely curable. So the point which Dr. TD was making that if it is a lesion which is surgically or endoscopically accessible as we will see a little later, every attempt must be made to establish a tissue diagnosis either for malignancy or for tuberculosis. If the biopsy is negative, 
you should again try to get a biopsy done. If it is resectable, you should try to resect because if it turns out to be tuberculosis, it can be treated. So based on radiological suspicion alone of malignancy, the patient should not be condemned to no treatment. We should always try to get the diagnosis as far as possible. And the other point which Dr. Sasmal mentioned, the involvement of other organs in the abdomen, which by definition are not included in abdominal tuberculosis, which is the genitourinary tract tuberculosis, especially the genital tract in females. And in every female patient who has a menstrual irregularity, who has infertility, in whom some kind of a TO mass is present, again, one should think whether the GI symptoms are also related to uh, tuberculosis that has to be kept in mind. And although it doesn't fall in our domain, but if the patient has symptoms related to the urinary tract or to the genital tract, uh, then uh, along with abdominal symptoms, then again in a multi-system involvement, tuberculosis um, uh, should be kept in mind. So uh, I think that is the essence of what Dr. Uh, uh, Sasmal has presented. And of course, many of these aspects we will be covering in uh, further uh, presentations. Uh, Dr. Sitaram, Dr. Kotecha uh, from Tanzania has joined. Would you like to make any comment? Dr. Banerjee is also there. Dr. J.K. Banerjee. Only yes. one comment from my side. Yes, sir. Just like you said, uh, you should not say that the patient has got uh, incurable malignancy without proof. Uh, I feel that uh, Starting anti-tuberculosis treatment without either histology or bacteriology is not good practice. I feel that every effort should be made to get these two confirmations and to start anti-TB treatment without proof uh, should be restricted to very, very, very few patients because anti-TB treatment is not without its problems. Uh, and we have seen fairly serious problems in patients who have been started on such treatment without proof. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's very important. It is known as therapeutic trial, but as he said, it should be done in uh, uh, the rarest of rare cases. Every attempt should be made to establish the tissue diagnosis because the reverse is also true. What we are thinking of as tuberculosis may actually be malignancy. And then the treatment of malignancy would be delayed. Uh, and of course, uh, Crohn's disease is a great mimic. Uh, somewhere in the discussion, uh, that that point will uh, come. Uh, uh, so, Didi, um, I think we can proceed, please. Yeah, yeah. yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, uh, thank you, Dr. Prakash, and uh, 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 thank you, sir, and uh, Dr. Sitaram, sir, for good uh, comments. So, uh, let's go to the second uh, 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 speaker, and uh, Dr. Saurabh, who is uh, uh, Saurabh Garota, who is presenting Alana Institute. Uh, working as a GI surgeon. Dr. Saurabh, uh, he's going to talk about differential diagnosis, uh, means uh, in brackets, sir has written that how to uh, different, uh, how how TB can look like. So Dr. Saurabh, can you please uh, start your presentation and share your screen, please. Thank you. Good evening, sir. Please share your screen. Prakash, you stop kar diya. Prakash, please stop sharing. I have stopped it, sir. Okay. Dr. Sarov, is there any problem? Otherwise, I'll leave and I rejoin. No, actually, sir, uh, it's not on your part, probably on my part. My, my screen is not getting shared. If it is Apple, then there is a problem in the setting. We get uh, always there is some problem. So you have to allow. Uh, yes, sir, exactly. That's what I'm uh, trying to do. So you have to go in the setting and allow uh, this thing. Uh, some, uh, some, uh, some problem occurs in uh, this uh, mic. But Saurabh is already a co-host. You should be able to share. Uh, when you are clicking on the share screen, it's not showing? Yes, sir. Some kind of system preferences issue is cropping up, actually. That's what I'm trying to 
तो या फिर दोबारा दोबारा लॉग आउट करके लॉग इन दोबारा करो इन्फॉर्मेशन अबाउट अवर वेरियस एक्टिविटीज So all those who are watching live and who will be watching the video later, this is how you can join Jaipur Surgical Tutorial. Please send a WhatsApp message to my colleague, Dr. Anand Nagar, at this number. And as I said, we conduct a session every Saturday, nine to ten a.m. India time. For the master class, again, you have to send a message. In fact, if you become a member of JST, you will receive. information about the master classes automatically these are done last thursday and friday of every month 7 to 9 pm and this is the friday afternoon session especially for uh, colleagues from africa but anybody is uh, and everybody is welcome to join this is being uh, uh, moderated by dr kalash kodia who is again at aims uh, new delhi and uh, for today Uh, those of you who would like to read more about abdominal tuberculosis please send me a mail at vkkapoor.india@gmail.com write tb in the subject of the mail and uh, i will be sending you soft copies of some chapters on abdominal tuberculosis which i have written as i said earlier with dr iprar dr sasmal and dr galodha and a few other of my colleagues and this is the information about jaipur surgical festival 6 to 8 december complications in surgery that's the website for uh, registration Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, myself, Doctor Mohit, sir. I need to say something, sir, regarding diagnosis. Yes. Uh, sir, good evening. Uh, first of all, good evening to all. Sir, uh, yes. in maximum yes. patients, what we have seen, if we are not able to make the diagnosis just on the basis of the biopsy or on the basis of the any histological, we don't have any histological evidence. Sir, do some non-invasive thing first, sir. Sir, go for USG neck, USG axilla, and USG inguinal region, sir, to find out any lymph node involvement, sir. Then do if lymph nodes are there, do FNAC or excisional biopsy first. Second thing, go for ophthalmological evaluation to for choroid tubercle, sir, because if choroid tubercle is there, this is the definitive diagnosis of dissemination of the tuberculosis sir so usg neck axilla inguinal region along with usg uh, abdomen mm -hmm. ophthalmic evaluation for choroid tubercle montux test i am not saying in india it's a definitive diagnosis but it gives some evidence sir regarding montux test yeah. so uh, before going for another surgery or another invasive procedure Uh, go for for uh, for these non-invasive and the semi-invasive procedure. Then we will proceed for the sir another uh, invasive procedures. I think very okay. very important tips uh, which Doctor Mohit has given here. Yes, Saurabh, are you able to share now? Uh, sir, I'll quit and reopen. That's what. They... Ah, yes. Try now. Dr. Mohit is my colleague in pulmonary medicine at my institution. He will be joining us as a panelist tomorrow to talk to us about antitubercular treatment. But very important point which he made that uh, in addition to clinical examination and ultrasound evaluation of all the nodes, and if any nodes are seen, then targeting them and uh, 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 examination of the choroid plexus uh, by uh, of the medical examination.
sir can you mm-hmm. actually it says host disabled participant screen sharing mm-hmm. strangely i am so when you click on the share screen button what happens nothing so there is a uh, message calling host disabled participant screen sharing uh, himanshi can you please uh, make uh, dr uh, galoda yeah at the moment he is not a co host please make it a, make him a co host uh, sir already co host hi hai nahi nahi dikh raha hai usme he is not being seen earlier he was seen as a co host now he is not being seen as a co host please yes, check now try now yes i think it should yes, be yes. oh now we can see please start yeah so uh, the topic given to me was uh, good evening everyone i am dr saurabh from uh, department of gi surgery and liver transplant in aims new delhi and the topic given to me was what can abdominal tuberculosis look like which is like what are the differentials of an abdominal tuberculosis if we see the different types of abdominal tuberculosis that are there so uh, the different types or the different involvements in the abdominal tuberculosis can be lymph nodal involvement gastrointestinal system involvement solid organ involvement and the peritoneal involvement these are the basic involvement of in abdominal tuberculosis so if we see one by one uh, we will try to see the differentials in each one of them uh first one is the tuberculous lymphadenitis that is the commonest presentation of abdominal tuberculosis the symptoms usually depend on the site of involvement that is there and the commonest being the mesenteric lymph nodes so we can usually see something like a conglomerate mass of mesenteric lymph nodes which can lead to abdominal pain and uh, sometimes mass mass like formation dr sir uh, move to presentation mode presentation mode no yeah slide yes i guess better sir Thank sorry you. so the differential would be obviously the most common differential usually of abdominal mass would be an abdominal malignancy which can be a non seminomatous germ cell tumor a pancreatic cancer can present with the retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy they can be lymphomas then they can be metastasis then fungal infections like candida and aspergillosis and sometimes even celiac disease can present as a tuberculous lymphadenitis then if we go into a gastrointestinal tuberculosis it's usually rare but it has got three different morphological types one is the ulcerative one the second is the ulcero hypertrophic and third is the hypertrophic one all have almost similar presentations which can present like an obstruction of a perforation bleeding or a fistula and so in gastrointestinal tuberculosis i have actually are taken each uh, organ separately so initially if we start from above initially the first one would be esophageal tuberculosis which is usually very rare and can present with an ulceration or a nodular thickening or a stricture this could be due to the lymph nodal involvement which is around, around the esophagus which can lead to matting and then causing an external compression or there could be a nodular thickening in the esophagus itself the patient usually presents with dysphagia and retrosternal pain as we can see in the image there is a large mass in the mid uh, thoracic part of the esophagus which is com- uh, causing luminal narrowing and uh, later on you can see there are multiple uh, para esophageal lymph nodes and the differential to this would be a malignancy an esophageal malignancy will actually present with similar symptoms and similar presentation also then coming on to gastric tuberculosis which is to the tune of 0.4 to 2% mostly involves antrum and body region of the stomach and can lead to an ulceration or a stricture formation which eventually leads to symptoms like it is an ulceration can lead to bleeding if there is a stricture or stenosis of pylorus then it can lead to gastric outlet obstruction and sometimes uh, there can be a fistula so what are the differential in case of a benign disease the most common disease that we uh, usually used to encounter and which has actually reduced of late is the peptic ulcer disease and in its complications then there is rarely crohn's disease patients can have of syphilis and sarcoidosis can present with uh, strictures then in malignancy it can be a gastric adenocarcinoma which can present like a nodular mass it can be a cyst or a gastric lymphoma and sometimes even a pancreatic metastasis can uh, lead to a gastric uh, thickening or stenosis or a stricture formation leading to gastric outlet obstruction 
then coming to duodenal tuberculosis it most likely due to the contiguous involvement by the lymph nodes around it or sometimes an intrinsic very rarely intrinsic hypertrophic change can be there if there is an ulceration it can lead to a bleed and also a fistula with the adjacent structure so what are the differentials usually the patient with duodenal tuberculosis or a patient with tuberculosis per se is asthenic thin and can present with uh, duodenal obstruction or duodenal outlet obstruction which can be similar to like an sma syndrome obviously they can be in d1 they can be sequelae of peptic ulcer disease it can be crohn's disease uh, rarely and malignancies like lymphoma or a duodenal and a pancreatic carcinoma or the periampullary region carcinoma then coming to the intestinal tuberculosis this i have taken in uh, total because uh, usually the commonest involvement is an ileocecal involvement and rarely an isolated involvement can be there in jejunum or ileum but the most common is actually an ileocecal involvement which can present with pain abdomen obstruction perforation or fistula formation and the most common uh, presentation most common differential for this will be a crohn's disease which is actually since the very basic uh, uh, teaching has been that the most common differential of a tuberculosis intestinal tuberculosis is crohn's disease although it is very rare it is usually rare in uh, our subcontinent but still it is fairly common as far as uh, tertiary care centers are concerned then it can be an amebiasis like amebic ileitis or a colitis in salmonella or yersinia infection and obviously malignancy like an adenocarcinoma or lymphoma usually presenting like similar like there can be a coning of the cecum with uh, proximal dilatation there will be multiple lymph nodes which could be present and this could be differentiating features from uh, a malignancy in case of uh, intestinal tuberculosis then coming on to solid organ involvement then first is the hepatosplenic tuberculosis which can usually occur due to a hematogenous dissemination it can be of two forms one is a micronodular which is much more common to the tune of up to 80% while macronodular is usually up to 20% patients usually have non specific symptoms can have fever can have uh, symptoms like an abscess and uh, rarely the gallbladder can be very very rarely gallbladder can be involved but there are case reports uh, of uh, gallbladder tuberculosis also although xanthogranulomatous cholecystitis can be said to be uh, atypical but it's not exactly a gallbladder tuberculosis and uh, the micronodular can have differentials in the form of a cholangular abscess suppose a patient has a cholangitis and then develop cholangular abscess so multiple small abscesses can be there it can be diff other differential will be a lymphoma obviously metastasis from a primary disease and then sarcoidosis and fungal infections like histoplasmosis uh, can also be a differential for it, tuberculosis and these can present with multiple abscesses which can be seen in both liver as well as if you can see there are multiple in uh, spleen as well then macronodular usually a large abscess or a large mass can be there in the liver or multiple conglomerate masses will be seen which actually points to the differential of a uh, tuberculosis in this kind of a patient and uh, the differential for such a kind of hepatosplenic tuberculosis will be a pyogenic abscess or a metastasis or even a primary hepatic malignancy and uh, rarely a gallbladder cancer uh, can also present very similar to uh, such a large mass such a large mass is present in relation to the gallbladder a differential of a gallbladder malignancy has to be entertained and accordingly investigated and coming on to pancreatic tuberculosis which is usually a very 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 rare but there are small case studies and case reports for this usually most of about up to 80% the involvement is in the head region of the pancreas and can present like a head mass and there will be retropaternal lymphadenopathy associated with it but uh, the different and the differential for these could be carcinoma also most of these head masses can have cystic component to it so sometimes the other differential which is entertained is a cystic neoplasm of the pancreas so then we have to differentiate between these two and because a medical management of a tuberculosis can lead to resolution on the other hand uh, carcinoma or cystic neoplasm will require surgery in coming on to the very uh, another uh, aspect is the peritoneal tuberculosis which is actually the second most common presentation of abdominal tuberculosis this could be most commonly hematogenous and sometimes due to the contiguous spread uh from the uh, adjacent organs there are three types most commonly the wet or the ascitic type and the second is the dry type and third is the fibrotic type the dry type is the least common to only 10% patients while ascitic type can be seen
ियलियोमा <laughs> or a primary mesothelioma so these are the various differentials the various uh, diseases that we have to keep in mind when we are uh, considering uh, the differentials of a abdominal tuberculosis as far as the organs are concerned and the organ that is involved we have to take into consideration as well as the presentation and decide as to how we have to evaluate this patient you can see in this image also there is a momentum taking with some laal enhancement the blue lal ho raha tha iska kya matlab hai ho raha chart in case of this we can pehle to lal hota tha wo minimum and any other people please uh, please mute yourself there are some sound is coming sorry sir of just a minute please mute yourself other people there somebody is talking loudly and it is disturbing us yes sir of karian please so as we as i had described in the previous this is the bed type as you can see there is uh, ascites where there is clumping of the uh, uh, intestinal loops in the center of the abdomen similarly here we can see that there is a transition point and there is a proximal dilatation of the bowel with some amount of localated ascites so this this could be this is a case of a cocoon or a, a dry type of a, a abdominal tuberculosis in this case where we have uh, multiple loculate uh, mental cake we can see that there is an omental caking and then there are in multiple enhancing nodules inside the omentum so this is also one of the features of the omental uh, dry type of tub abdominal tuberculosis peritoneal tuberculosis and we can see multiple miliary tubercles which we can actually see on laparoscopy and then biopsy and send for a frozen section and if it is not malignancy then obviously we can consider that this is a tuberculosis although we have to consider the clinical presentation as well as the patient's presentation to us as one of the factors also and we have to rule out malignancy before we label the patient as a tuberculosis so these are the various differentials which we can see in abdominal tuberculosis i hope i have covered most of the differentials as far as abdominal tuberculosis is concerned thank you So can I stop sharing? Yes. yes sir, uh, thank you. Uh, sir, I think uh, we should uh, ask Dr. Uh, this uh, Dr. Pankaj also to present. Then we can. Uh, okay. Uh, because okay. Uh, this, this will be very common. Uh, this question is. Yes. yes. Dr. Pankaj. Yeah. Uh, could you please introduce Pankaj? Hello, Dr. Pankaj, are you there? Yeah, yeah. Pankaj is there. Pankaj, please. Hello. सेवरल अदर ग्रुप which is a very important um, ultrasound uh, kind of guideline to differentiate between benign and malignant uh, lesions of the gallbladder pankaj please good evening everyone uh, <clears throat> i hope my screen is visible and uh, i am well audible uh, abhi nahi hai dr pankaj screen is not visible okay. so please share i will share please let me know sir now is it yes 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 now it's visible yes uh, good evening everyone uh, thank you uh, professor kapoor and professor yadav for that uh, introduction and uh, i think i have a lot of motivation from both the moderators uh, i look forward to them for all kind of clinical inputs and uh, guidance uh, today i'll be talking about imaging in abdominal tuberculosis <coughs> 
uh, introduction part has been mostly covered and we know the uh, gravity of the situation. And in fact, tuberculosis remains one of the most common diseases in our country. Uh, though pulmonary tuberculosis is most common, uh, we see a fair bit of extra pulmonary TB of which abdominal involvement occurs in around 11 to 12 percent of patients. And uh, imaging uh, is cornerstone of uh, diagnosis of abdominal tuberculosis. It has also been uh, delved by the previous speakers that uh, abdominal TB can involve the lymph nodes, peritoneum, intestinal tract, and solid viscera. A combination of intestinal, peritoneal, and lymphatic involvement is noted in two thirds of the cases. And in another one third, there could be only extra intestinal involvement. Coming to the various imaging modalities, we have a host of investigations that are available to us, of which plane radiographs are the uh, basic initial investigation we rely on. Barium series, uh, including the uh, barium meal and barium meal follow through, was uh, considered a very important uh, imaging component for evaluating patients with suspected GI tuberculosis, but it has mostly been replaced by CT-based studies, including CT enterography. I'll be talking about that later. Ultrasound, CT, and MRI uh, play a very important role uh, to evaluate the entire extent of disease, uh, particularly in case of GI tract. Uh, it provides a, a detailed information of the lumen, the wall, as well as extra luminal components, as well as other parts of the abdominal cavity. Uh, there is some uh, evolving data regarding the role of PET CT in uh, patients with abdominal tuberculosis. Abdominal radiograph mostly uh, plays a role when uh, we see a patient coming with uh, features of small bowel obstruction. Uh, this is just for the residents a bit of recap of uh, how we diagnose intestinal obstruction on a plain radiograph. So a plain radiograph uh, uh, in case of intestinal obstruction will show us dilated gas-filled bowel loops. Uh, please mind that when these loops are uh, filled with fluid, which is not an uncommon scenario, we will see a gasless abdomen. Uh, in the absence of Ryle's tube, dilated stomach along with dilated small bowel also points to the presence of small bowel obstruction. And when small bowel is dilated out of proportion to the colon, that's another sign of small bowel obstruction. In addition, when we uh, obtain radiographs in erect or lateral uh, position, the presence of air fluid levels that are multiple and at different levels, longer than 2.5 centimeters, also suggest the possibility of intestinal obstruction on plain radiograph. Plain radiographs are also important to uh, evaluate the presence of uh, chest disease in patients uh, in whom we are strongly suspecting abdominal TB and also to look for any features of intestinal perforation in the form of air under diaphragm. Ultrasound, I would say, is an underutilized tool in patients with abdominal tuberculosis. We have started increasingly utilize it for evaluation of vowel in abdominal TB as well as other diseases. It is as sensitive as abdominal radiograph, but is more specific than abdominal radiograph for the diagnosis of uh, intestinal tuberculosis. Particularly, the IC region is very well visualized on ultrasound, and with expertise, uh, one would be really utilizing it to its maximum potential. It can uh, give us the uh, cause and level of uh, obstruction and can also help us diagnose some of the complications of intestinal tuberculosis. Uh, needless to say, uh, ultrasound is a very useful tool for evaluation of uh, lymph nodes as well as solid viscera, and it provides guidance for fine needle aspiration cytology or biopsy that is frequently employed in diagnosis of abdominal tuberculosis. Abdominal uh, CT is coronal store of imaging of patients with uh, uh, suspected abdominal tuberculosis. And there are different techniques of uh, uh, the uh, CT that we employ for patients suspected uh, to suffer from abdominal tuberculosis. Uh, we can perform CT with oral contrast. IV contrast is always mandatory. In patients who present with acute obstruction, usually nothing is given orally, as we know that bowel is already dilated and fluid filled. I'll be talking about CT enterography, which is being increasingly utilized and is replacing the in patients with abdominal TB. And we see that uh, abdominal CT has a very high sensitivity and specificity for diagnosis of small bowel obstruction in general and also in the setting of abdominal tuberculosis. 
No, the question is why we have moved away from very meal follow through into CT angiography is because of several advantages of a cross sectional imaging technique uh, and several disadvantages with very meal follow through. BMFT, as we know, is operator dependent and involves lengthy in examinations. Bowel loops, as we know, are overlapping structures, and hence uh, in two dimensional imaging, it will be difficult to discern the uh, changes or uh, lesions in all the bowel loops. And uh, the uh, IC junction is very difficult to demonstrate on a bearing wheel follow through. And obviously, as I've discussed previously, CT gives us a comprehensive evaluation of the wall as well as extra intestinal abnormalities. The other important uh, thing uh, for the students is uh, what is CT enterocolysis, which is uh, and uh, how does it differ from CT enterography? So we should remember that CT enterography is now the standard technique, and uh, we use CT enterocolysis. Uh, very sparingly, at least in our centers, and I am aware of the other centers in India also that uh, most of the centers use CT andrography. CT androgolysis basically involves intubation of the duodenum under fluoroscopy, and hence it increases the radiation dose as well as discomfort to the patient. And some of the studies have shown that the distension achieved with CT andrography is comparable to that achieved with CT androgolysis. We also have MR andrography at our disposal, and the advantages are the lack of ionizing radiation and a very, very useful uh, advantage of MR enterography is the ability to perform a dynamic imaging, which can help us uh, differentiate a stricture from uh, uh, basically a peristalt uh, peristaltic motion, which will be, I mean, difficult on any other imaging uh, test. However, we know that MR uh, enterography has a limited availability as well as limited expertise is available for evaluation of MR examinations. So I'll be just showing a few of the uh, techniques here. So this was a CT of the abdomen done with uh, positive oral contrast. As you can see, there is a uh, presence of positive contrast within the bowel. Compare this with this particular uh, type of examination, which is performed with the neutral oral contrast, which is typically a PEG or manitol. We uh, use uh, PEG in our institution and uh, other institutions uh, use manitol. So they can be used interchangeably. These are some of the images uh, of uh, MR enterography. So this is a, uh, these are T2 weighted sequences where we can see that uh, the fluid uh, which is administered is appearing bright. However, the cornerstone of MR enterography is a dynamic contrast enhanced MR where we see the fluid as a black structure and any lesion will be appearing as a bright structure against that uh, black background. Uh, we uh, theoretically can understand that PET will add the functional component to uh, the CT enterography component. So uh, there is something known as PET CT enterography. However, we also understand that it increases the cost significantly as well as radiation dose. So it's not very commonly employed and is mostly used as a research tool or uh, uh, in various research protocols. Uh, in some cases where there is a, a diagnostic dilemma which remains unresolved after extensive evaluation, PET CT enterography may be utilized. Coming to uh, the description of imaging, uh, uh, findings in each uh, particular type of abdominal TB. Abdominal lymphadenopathy uh, is one of the commonest manifestations of uh, abdominal tuberculosis, and usually multiple lymph nodes uh, are affected, and uh, mesenteric and peripancreatic uh, group of lymph nodes are the most commonly involved. The hallmark of uh, uh, tubercular lymphadenitis is the presence of necrotic lymph nodes that appear as uh, uh, hypoechoic or anechoic uh, on ultrasound. However, one should remember that uh, this classic pattern is present only in around one uh, uh, half of the patients with abdominal TB. Now, this is one of the older slides. I just intentionally put it to demonstrate that how necrotic lymph nodes appear. So necrotic lymph nodes appear as peripherally enhancing uh, structures with central necrosis appearing as a black uh, thing within the center of the lymph node. So the presence of necrotic lymph nodes is in fact one of the most specific features of abdominal tuberculosis when we are trying to differentiate it from other common mimickers. The other uh, patterns of uh, tubercular lymph nodes would be a conglomerate lymph node uh, mass in the uh, mesentery or elsewhere. And sometimes what we have seen is that patients may have increased number of lymph nodes which are of normal size within the mesentery. Uh, besides necrosis, calcification also supports uh, the diagnosis of tuberculosis or in general, I would say granulomatous uh, inflammation and uh, does give us a, a reasonable idea as to what we are dealing with. Uh, also, it is important to remember uh, that 
tubercular lymphadenitis must be differentiated from lymphoma. And uh, I have just tabulated some of the differences between the two. So here we can see that there are necrotic peripherally enhancing lymph nodes. Compare this with lymphoma, where the lymph nodes appear more homogeneous. Also note the location of lymph nodes. Lymph nodes in TB are usually uh, the uh, most concentrated in the mesentery. And in case of lymphoma, these are present both in the upper as well as lower abdomen. Retrocrural uh, location is one of the sites which favors uh, to, uh, the lymphomatous uh, uh, involvement. Now coming to uh, peritoneal tuberculosis, previous uh, speaker has uh, uh, shed some light on this particular topic, but what I would like to add here is the fact that uh, 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 this classification into wet, fibrotic and dry type is somewhat confusing and we do see overlapping features. And uh, our uh, uh, medical and gastroenterology group uh, has sort of tried to uh, propose uh, a clinical based classification, which uh, is basically a distension dominant type of peritoneal tuberculosis versus a pain obstruction dominant type of tuberculosis, which are characterized respectively by presence of ascites or uh, presence of cocoon and peritoneal adhesions or fibrosis. Uh, coming to some of the examples of uh, peritoneal tuberculosis. So uh, one of the most common findings in peritoneal tuberculosis is presence of loculated ascites. On ultrasound, it is, it is not uncommon to find echoes within the uh, peritoneal uh, fluid on ultrasound. And on CT, uh, we see that there is enhancement of the peritoneum. And usually the fluid in case of uh, abdominal uh, uh, tuberculosis appears uh, hyperdense as compared to, uh, maybe you can compare it with urinary bladder. So urine uh, will be uh, a baseline for comparison. And if we see a fluid more dense than that, then we can suspect the presence of tubercular peritonitis. These are some of the examples to show the mental involvement. So these are ultrasound images. So we use ultrasound very frequently in evaluating patients with abdominal TB, and we are now able to identify the presence of uh, omental thickening on ultrasound using a linear high resolution probe. So you can see that there is a, a plaque like thickening of the momentum here. Another example, again, to show the thickening of the momentum along with the situs. Another example, you can see that uh, the momentum is thickened and heterogeneous. Uh, on CT, we uh, again see momentum as either smudge structure in the form of uh, nodules. You can see nodules here, multiple nodules. Uh, and I'll be discussing some differences between uh, peritoneal tuberculosis and uh, peritoneal carcinomatosis later. Uh, again, the mesentery is also involved in case of uh, uh, peritoneal tuberculosis, and there can be presence of lymph nodes or micronodules, along with presence of ascites and peritoneal thickening. Uh, this entity has been discussed previously by both the speakers. Again, uh, uh, imaging is uh, diagnostic of this uh, uh, disease. And uh, again, we can see that there is clumping of the bowel loops, and one can see that there is an enhancing membrane uh, leading to uh, the obstruction. Uh, this is a rare presentation, uh, one of the odd cases that uh, I saw, uh, where we can see that there is formation of collection in the peritoneal cavity, uh, CT of the same patient, and we were keeping possibilities of uh, some soft tissue tumors. When we uh, sort of biopsied this case, it turned out to be tubercular abscess in the peritoneal cavity. Uh, as I discussed previously, one of the important differentials of uh, peritoneal tuberculosis is peritoneal carcinomatosis. Again, similar findings, presence of uh, omental caking, large amount of ascites. Uh, again, uh, the presence of uh, omental nodules, uh, some degree of peritoneal thickening, uh, and nexal lesions. So, I mean, both findings, as you can see in TB and peritoneal carcinomatosis can overlap. So, uh, are there any features that can help us differentiate between the two? This was a recent study performed by our group, uh, where actually we saw that uh, except for the nodular involvement of the momentum, there were no other uh, features in the mesentery or peritoneum or momentum that could differentiate peritoneal tuberculosis from peritoneal carcinomatosis. However, the presence of loculated ascites, conglomerated lymph nodes, and the mesentric location of lymph nodes were significantly associated with tubercular peritonitis. Coming to uh, the imaging of GI tract, uh, as previous speakers have told, any part of the GI tract can be involved, uh, though the ileocecal region is the most commonly involved site. Uh, esophageal TB uh, is uncommon, and uh, uh, the I mean, uh, 
we uh, recently performed a systematic review and uh, found that uh, the i'm talking just of the uh, uh, imaging findings here but this was a obviously a comprehensive systematic review covering other features also and we found that uh, the most common finding in case of chest x-ray was basically media standard binding and I mean, it is logical also that most of the findings of esophageal tuberculosis will be because of the lymph node uh, compression. And on barium uh, swallow, uh, one can expect presence of uh, extrinsic uh, compression of the esophagus, sinus formation, strictures, or fish flow formation. Uh, these are images from uh, Professor Nagi's paper uh, published in ECTA Radiologic in 2003. And we know that Madam was an uh, expert in performing these barium uh, studies. And uh, on CT chest, again, we can expect media standard lymphadenopathy and non-specific uh, esophageal wall thickening. Gastrodrenal TB, again, uh, the previous speakers have uh, highlighted its rarity and uh, non-specific clinical features. And uh, imaging manifestations, basically, again, are because of either the extrinsic compression by lymph node or neural involvement leading on to stricture. Another example of the enteropyloric stricture in the setting of uh, the gastrodrenal tuberculosis. This was an interesting case. Uh, 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 here, the coronal CT shows us that there is asymmetric neural thickening of the duodenum with marked lubricant narrowing. Uh, what led us to the diagnosis of TB was this necrotic mesenteric lymph node and some necrotic lymph nodes in the uh, mediastinum. So, this was a case of uh, duodenal tuberculosis. Coming to uh, the uh, tubercular enteritis, uh, this uh, classification, I'm not sure whether it is followed now, but this was uh, conventionally. Uh, sort of stated as first stage where there was accelerated transition in the intestine followed by a stage of ulceration and uh, finally the formation of strictures. Now, these were very important signs previously. Uh, I don't think these are, uh, I mean, seen in the present scenario where very meal follow-through is not performed, but for students historically, uh, we had uh, signs because of the changes in morphology of the cecum as well as IC valve leading on to different uh, imaging appearances of uh, the uh, barium meal study. So here we can see that the cecum is markedly contracted and there is widening of the IC valve. Here we have a stricture and ulceration of the IC valve. Uh, the hallmark of uh, imaging diagnosis is now the ability to identify the uh, mural changes directly as well as extra luminal changes on CT. And uh, the finding which we rely on diagnosis of TB is basically presence of uh, mural thickening uh, present mostly in the uh, terminal ileum IC valve and cecum in a contiguous fashion. Uh, initially, the thickening could be mild, but later on there could be marked thickening of the vowel. There could be adherence with the adjacent loops and uh, together with presence of uh, multiple lymph nodes around it. Some of the uh, important features of uh, uh, abdominal tuberculosis is presence of short strictures, which can be multiple or solitary, and uh, usually associated with stricture in the ileocecal region. And symmetric involvement is more common. I'll be talking more about these when I talk about differences between TB and Crohn's disease. Now, this is a case where we perform both CT as well as uh, the uh, barium enterocolysis. Uh, this. So here we can see how actually CT adds to our uh, diagnosis. In uh, barium enterocolysis, as we can see that we can just see the lumen and there is a, uh, a very uh, short stricture, very tight stricture in the uh, ileum. However, on, however, on uh, CT we see that there is presence of uh, mural thickening, which is circumferential and concentric. It is homogeneous. We don't really see any increased uh, uh, mesenteric vascularity. So this was basically a case of intestinal tuberculosis. Uh, so as you can make out, this was a study that was done with oral uh, positive oral contrast. However, we are performing more of enterocolysis studies now. And here are some of the other manifestations of uh, intestinal tuberculosis. So you can see that there is a symmetric uh, mural thickening of the terminal ileum. Again, uh, there is no increased vascularity. Uh, there is no mural stratification. On the other hand, this was a case of uh, intestinal tuberculosis where you can see mural stratification. So by mural stratification, I mean that there is more enhancement of the inner layer compared to rest of the uh, wall of the, uh, the intestine and also see that there is a homogeneously enhancing lymph node. No, this could be really a, a great confusion between Crohn's disease and TB, but this was a case of a proven, uh, histopathologically proven case of TB. Uh, another example of uh, tubercular stricture 
and in this case uh, a rather unusual manifestation of a long segment structure of uh, the tubercular enteritis this is more common uh, finding which we can correlate from a very mild follow through study uh, extremely contracted conical type of cecum and there is a structure at the ic valve and you can see a large enterolith sitting at the terminal ileum we really don't use much of mr enterography these were some of the cases we performed uh, mostly because there was concern of repeated radiation exposure so in this case again you can see that there is a, a circumferential bulge thickening of the terminal ileum beautifully seen at contrast enhanced uh, mr enterography uh, this is a, a important uh, topic differentiation of idiosyncratic tuberculosis from crohn's disease at at least the tertiary centers we are commonly faced with this uh, dilemma and uh, these are just i mean features that can guide us uh, mind you that these are not absolute and overlap is very common but uh, we know that uh, cecum uh, along with ileum or contiguous involvement of cecum and ileum is much more common in case of idiosyncratic tb uh, tubercular structures are sh short segment usually uh, not uh, more than four segments are involved the skip lesions are rare and uh, there are other features also i would recommend this uh, the students to go through this paper uh however uh, you must understand that these features may not be statistically significant this was a systematic review performed by the aims group which showed that uh, the uh, finding that had a highest diagnostic accuracy for uh, diagnosis of idiosyncratic tb was necrotic lymph node so in fact this is the most specific finding so if in a scenario where you are faced with dilemma between tb and crohn's disease you see necrotic lymph node you are absolutely sure that you are dealing with tuberculosis and not crohn's disease uh for the diagnosis of crohn's disease home sign which is basically increased uh, mesenteric vascularity followed by skip lesions is uh, having the highest diagnostic accuracy colorectal tb uh, again comprises around 10% of the uh, gi uh, tb and based on different series the common sites of involvement have been variably reported uh, this could be ascending colon or the transverse colon and multiple uh, sites of involvement are common i'll show you some examples here so this was a, a patient with uh, Uh, mural thickening and enhancement involving the cecum, and and usually uh, it has been reported that cecal involvement, if we consider that as a uh, sort of colonic TB, so it will be usually contiguous with the ileum. So in strict sense, it will still be ileocecal TB, but in this particular case, we are seeing that the uh, thickening is extending to involve the ascending colon. Also, see a lot of mesenteric uh, and pericolonic necrotic lymph nodes. You can see this uh, peripheral enhancement and central necrosis. uh this was a case where we see the thickening extending to the hepatic flexure lot of thickening and uh, the differential diagnosis of uh, uh, colonic uh, malignancy should definitely be considered in this case a uh, few more examples here a very tight structure of the hepatic flexure uh, in this case you can see multiple structures involving the descending colon as well as sigmoid colon uh an annular type of structure involving the ascending colon here and in this case uh, what actually leads us, us to diagnosis is presence of extra intestinal manifestation in the form of a large swas abscess uh a case of uh, colonic tb diagnosed on mr enterography so here we can see that there is a tight structure of the ascending colon which is showing lot of mural uh, enhancement Uh, again i mean i would again uh, like to reemphasize one fact is that uh, in patients with suspected abdominal tb sometimes the clue may not come from abdominal abdomen itself but from the other side so for example in this case we see lot of miliary nodules in the uh, lungs which can be one of the important findings for clinching the diagnosis in this case we can see that there is left sided pleural effusion with calcification and in this example we see there is some pericardial effusion so this could be some important ancillary findings in this case you can see that there is a swas ileus swas abscess so one should carefully look for these findings uh, and these can actually uh, lead us to diagnose i'll be quickly running through some rare uh, examples of uh, abdominal tb these have already been discussed by my previous colleagues so i'll be focusing more on the imaging features here so these are examples from our own patients so uh, in this case we see micro nodular form of uh, hepatic tb so we again rely a lot on ultrasound because it sounds has a higher i would say resolution for picking up these subtle findings particularly the high resolution probe so you can see these ill defined uh, hypoechoic lesions which are small smaller than 10 mm uh, another case where we see slightly larger uh, nodules a uh, case of macronodular tb more than 10 mm and in this case we saw a single uh, lesion which uh, we also confirmed on uh, ct 
with some peripheral uh, HPRD, this was confirmed to be case of uh, uh, hepatic TB again. A very rare form of TB which I would like the students to remember is one where you see some lesion along the capsule, which is a serohepatic form of TB, uh, which is also known as sugar coating. We uh, often on see these type of cases and now from our experience, we know that we are dealing with TB. Uh, so this form should be kept in mind. Splenic uh, uh, tuberculosis again presents in a similar way with uh, micro nodules. Again, uh, these are very well seen on a high resolution ultrasound compared to CT. And uh, another example where we had just one lesion in the spleen, a case of uh, macronodular TB. This was a case of uh, splenic tubercular abscess, a large lesion in the inferior pole. Uh, this was a rather interesting case, a patient with acute pancreatitis in whom incidentally uh, we detected a splenic lesion. We performed CUS and thought it was a case of hemangioma, but uh, uh, as patient was symptomatic, we performed an FNA and a diagnosis of uh, acid fast bacilli positive uh, TB was confirmed. Uh, biliary tract involvement is rare. Uh, I don't have examples to show here, but I would like to, I mean, uh, point here that features that uh, should uh, lead us to think about biliary TB or uh, tubercular cholangitis is the presence of associated findings of hepatic granulomas or calcified necrotic uh, local regional lymph nodes and periductal calcification. Pancreatic TB again is rare. The previous speakers have shown some examples. I'll be adding to it. So as uh, has been told previously, most commonly the head of the pancreas is involved. And in fact, some of the uh, investigators try to club the uh, peripancreatic lymph nodes together with pancreas to call it pancreatic TB. It is a bit, uh, I mean, debatable. Uh, but in this particular example, we see that there are multiple lesions in the uh, body and tail of pancreas and confirmed to be a case of pancreatic TB. Appendicular involvement is, is very rare, but I would like to, I mean, highlight here uh, particularly because of the fact that sometimes uh, if uh, one sees a disproportionate thickening of the cecum and ascending colon in a patient suspected to be uh, a case of idiopathic acute appendicitis, it is very important to uh, consider a diagnosis of uh, TB. And uh, if these patients undergo appendectomy uh, without suspecting a diagnosis of abdominal TB, then there could be real problems like uh, sinus formation. And we have had uh, seen a recent case in our uh, center where a young lady had uh, features of acute appendicitis, but imaging showed a lot of thickening of the uh, cecum and ascending colon. In fact, the surgeon has also recorded that there was a very uh, significant thickening of the uh, cecum and terminal ileum, but underwent append appendectomy, but later on developed uh, sinus and was finally confirmed as a case of appendicular TB, or rather, uh, I would say, the colonic TB. So to summarize, imaging is vital in managing patients with abdominal TB. Contrast and CT is the most common imaging test. CT enterography uh, allows a comprehensive evaluation of bowel and mesentery. Uh, we should use MR enterography when we uh, are performing multiple examinations. We should always keep radiation dose in mind. And personally, I believe that ultrasound is, is far underutilized. And I would like to compare it with Crohn's disease. Now you see European countries are using ultrasound very frequently in patients with Crohn's disease. So we should also think about incorporating more of ultrasound in evaluation of patients with abdominal tuberculosis. Uh, thank you very much. So thank you, Dr. Pankaj. Um, uh, you uh, shared uh, such a nice pictures and uh, especially to differentiate between the other uh, other diseases of the abdomen where uh, tuberculosis, how can it can be differentiated mm -hmm. from malignancy. So uh, I would like to uh, start with asking one uh, simple question that uh, uh, rarely we have seen internal fistula also uh, between the bowel, maybe the small bowel with large bowel and one of the patient had the fistula with the, with the bladder. So... Any, 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 any experience of this type of uh, tuberculosis? Yeah, uh, thank you for asking that question, sir. Uh, in fact, I mean, uh, sinuses and fistulas are considered to be uh, much more common with Crohn's disease. But I agree with you that there are some cases on and off that we see there, there is some localized or contained perforation and that later converts to formation of enteroentric fistula. So, if patient has other features that are, uh, are sort of uh, going along with abdominal TB, even in the presence of uh, enteroenteric fistula, one has to consider diagnosis of abdominal TB uh, rather than uh, Crohn's disease, uh, although uh, enteroenteric fistulas are more common in Crohn's disease. 
and one more uh, point you uh, in in a uh, nodal uh, you, you talked about necrosis uh, that would happen even in uh, malignancy nodal uh, necrosis so one uh, differentiation you told that it would, would be in the mesentery uh, more 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 in the mesentery area and uh, malignancy part may be more in the in the uh, belong the vessels any other uh, differentiating features radiological other than site yeah, sir. Uh, I mean, that's again a, a difficult uh, clinical scenario. I think we get a lot of input from the patient's clinical uh, presentation or from our, uh, I mean, clinical colleagues. But uh, usually, if, uh, I, my my personal experience is that we see a patient who is young and uh, who has uh, necrotic lymph nodes. Our tendency is more towards uh, thinking it to be a case of uh, abdominal TB. On the other hand, in a patient who is elderly. Uh, with necrotic lymph nodes, more in retroperitoneal location, uh, bulkier in size, uh, we would uh, think more on lines of uh, uh, malignancy. But in these cases, we, as was, I mean, highlighted by one of the speakers, we definitely want to perform a, a biopsy, uh, core biopsy or FNA sometimes. Uh, if we are suspecting more on lines of malignancy, I personally uh, prefer to perform biopsy rather than performing uh, FNA alone. Uh, but uh, yes, I mean, uh, it can be sometimes a very, very difficult scenario to differentiate the two. So I think um, uh, uh, most of the things have been covered uh, uh, with, the, with the very strong message that if, if you want to label somebody uh, like malignancy and want to either exclude the diagnosis of malignancy or it, uh, by try to be confirmed about the diagnosis of abdominal tuberculosis. So ultimately, we have to take the help of any type of tissue tissue diagnosis. Uh, uh, any other comment, Kapoor, sir? Then yeah, we can... I, I have two questions, uh, Pankaj. Uh, one is that, is there today any place and role of uh, uh, contrast, uh, simple contrast studies like uh, barium or gastrographin? Yes, yeah, we are performing uh, barium swallows even today. But as far as the small bowel barium studies are concerned i mean we have totally stopped doing that and it's just the post-op scenario where we are doing some uh, barium or contrast studies and i mean the reason is quite clear that we get much more information with uh, ct than what we get with barium the other is that uh, uh, between ct and mr because many of these patients are young women uh, can mr give the same information as ct because then uh, you can do it safely without uh, risk of radiation? Yeah, sir, my, I mean, personal experience and recommendation is to basically uh, do at least CT at baseline. So, I mean, okay. uh, because CT uh, sections are much more thinner and we have much more confidence when we are scrolling through the entire scan. So, I think the baseline scan should be a CT scan. Uh, I think there may be differences of opinion, I agree, but I mean, my personal preference would be to do a baseline CT and on follow-up, definitely we know where is the disease. And following that up would be easier uh, based on MR. The other is uh, uh, many surgical students are not clear as to what is the difference between enterography and enterocolysis. Uh, okay, I try to highlight that a bit, but I'll again uh, sort of uh, clarify it. So when we are saying enterocolysis, basically we are trying to intubate, uh, putting a tube through the uh, nasal route into the, uh, uh, I mean, at least across the, uh, uh, I mean, pylorus into the duodenum or preferably into the first part of the duodenum. And then we are trying to instill uh, the uh, contrast, whatever contrast we want to give. Usually we are giving a neutral contrast, which is either a PEG or a mannitol. And we have uh, definite protocols for that. I will not go into that, uh, the details of that. But basically putting a tube and giving uh, much more uh, in a controlled way, is basically what we call as enterocolysis. On the other hand, when we say entero, uh, uh, CT enterography, we are giving orally, we are allowing the patient to take orally, but again, one has to keep in mind that it is not like the routine uh, uh, CT with oral contrast because here we have specific instruction for the patient. We want patient to divide the oral fluid into definite aliquids. Uh, by that, I mean that if we have to give 1.5 liter to the patient, we advise the patient to divide that into... Uh, four or five halves, and then he has to take those halves, I mean, uh, uh, over certain time uh, interval. 
rather than taking it continuously because you want to have a predictable uh, distension of the entire bowel. So that's the difference. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Sanjay Gambhir, who's uh, chief of nuclear medicine at SGPGI, he wants to make a comment. Gambhir, please come in. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kapoor. Uh, very nice presentations, all which were just enumerated. A very interesting discussion. So I would like to add about the PET in specific. So though it was just mentioned uh, that it can be done in the PET entropolysis. So I would like to enumerate a few more things about PET. We have done studies specifically in extra, uh, you know, uh, to extra chest tuberculosis outside the chest, especially the abdominal tuberculosis and anywhere else. So one thing we have found, and it was done under the ages of uh, IAEA, that is International Atomic Agency, and most of the studies were contributed by the Indian participated participants, including PGI Chandigarh. So what we found out briefly is, as Petit does it from the head to toe or the mid thigh, so you get all the lesions in tuberculosis. Tuberculosis or other granulomatous disease take up FDG very strongly very actively. So as somebody earlier said, you do multiple ultrasound of each axilla and whatever. So all that is covered in one go. You see everything. So of course, the differential diagnosis issue remains, whether it's Crohn's or you're talking of the malignancy or your other glandulomatous disease. So other thing is by the distribution of this lesion, you know that it is, you know, outside the abdomen too, or the pelvic regions are involved, like earlier mentioned by Dr. Kaput, the gynecological cases, the reproductive organs. So by the distribution and multiplicity of the tissue outside the chest, you come to know from distribution pattern is likely to be tuberculosis. The other thing is the cases we did was, which were screened with X-ray chest or CT or even ultrasound, and there was no pointing lesion. So that was our core group. So what PET does is will give you the lesion, even in the solid organs of the abdomen, like you were talking about spleen and the liver. So you know which is the lesion from where you can take the tissue or biopsy, which you were not able to find on the ultrasound and all. So overall holistic picture of the disease, burden of the disease, so to say, and likely point from where you can take the tissue and make the diagnosis. Still at times when you take tissue, I know that molecular part has not yet been discussed. Still you fail to establish tuberculosis from the tissue sample or the fluids from the loculated cavity or peritoneal masses, whatever. So that distribution gives you a very high uh, reference that it is likely to be tuberculosis or you can take sample. And third thing I think you will discuss tomorrow and all is about the treatment, the length of the treatment, the burden of the disease, and when you stop, apart from the standard protocol, when do you stop your antituberculosis treatment? As was mentioned, these are very toxic treatment, you know, medicine, and some people do not bear it well. So you know when the lesion has completely gone away, the, the inflammation has gone away, and you can safely stop the, you know, treatment. And the once where within first three months, the response is not coming, picture is still positive. And you know, these are likely to be the resistant variety. If uh, matching with the, some resistance test is done right at the beginning of the treatment regimen or not. So some patients don't respond. So these are two, three points, multiplicity of the, uh, you know, organ involvement point from where to take the biopsy and follow up the, the patient. We have where we have found it to be very useful, and of course, PT PET also does a CT. So distribution of nodes, which are very active, along with their position or necrosis, everything is uh, obtainable in one test. So that these are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to highlight what Dr. Sanjay Gambhir said, I think very important point. I am just showing a picture. I hope you can see it. Uh, this is somebody known to me who had a young lady who had multiple lymph nodes all over the body. And the clinical diagnosis obviously was lymphoma because she had some systemic symptoms also. And a PET was done, which showed involvement of each and every group of lymph nodes, including uh, liver lesion in the liver, 
and then fortunately the biopsy showed that this is tuberculosis so she is now being treated with the uh, ATT so just to highlight what Dr. Gambhir said and of course the other um, the counter is that uh, it can create problem uh, by showing a false negative uh, uh, lesion so uh, I mean uh, it, it uh, lights up like a malignancy uh, in cases where we are thinking of malignancy but it is uh, not malignant. Mm, yeah, tissue some... has to be taken off for the final thing. Yes, yeah, yeah, definitely. I think Abhinav was, uh, he messaged me, Dr. Abhinav Sharma, he is a product of SGPGI again, a medical gastroenterologist uh, who is to cover the endoscopic uh, management. Mm, he messaged me that he is busy with some procedure. So maybe he is still tied up. Did he, what we can do, maybe for a couple of minutes, we can have some discussion on some sir, aspects. I have, I have one question, sir. Uh, yes, to Sanjay ahead, please, please come in. Sir, is there, a, is there any cutoff value of FT uptake uh, which differentiate between malignancy or tuberculosis, sir? Uh, Sanjay, would you like to take that? Yeah, yeah. so this is very oft asked question for malignancy or various kind of malignancy or sarcoma or whatever. So there, there are no cutoffs. So that point should be very, very clear, whether it's lymphoma or whether it's Crohn. Is the distribution and the follow-up, if you have the tissue or follow-up PET scans or whatever follow-up you are doing. So there are short answer is there are no cutoffs. Usually the granuloma matters uptake SUVs are much higher than them. Again, there are overlaps. Usually, I'm saying usually. So there is no sharp cutoff. Uh, that's point. So people ask for it. I think more important is the the way these lesions are, whatever experience has told is, the way these are distributed. And then you can even at times people are presented as the, you know, extra pulmonary, but we end up seeing the pulmonary involvement also, which was not picked up by the, by the CT or the plain x-ray. So the distribution is very important. Burden of the disease, and you have to have tissue. Once you have got that, you still have doubts. You have to put, uh, you know, get a biopsy or FNAC uh, fluid, whatever you want to do. So no cutoffs. Yes, sir. So my second question is: many of the patient who comes to us, uh, they have already history of some carcinoma. So they right. go for their uh, uh, for again they go to the medical oncology part, and directly they will do the PET CT instead of CCT or some other investigations. So should we go for CT abdomen again after PET CT or should we rely on the finding of PET CT, sir? Yeah, so a very uh, good question. You see, if, if you are doing PET CT studies, one should be clear. Normally, it can be like any CT. It can be done with the CT contrast or without the CT. Based on the indication, what we are looking for whether the referring physician suggests or we think is appropriate, we add the contrast. We don't add it right and left. A lot of centers private in uh, India, they as a routine protocol, they do all their PET CT studies with contrast, simply based on the, the, the premise that something should not be missed, right? So they, they want to do it. So once you have do, done with a contrast, so you are doing a diagnostic CT. That is the standard CT with whatever current CT tube gives you diagnostic imaging. So if you have done with the contrast, the PET CT, you do not need a second CT because you have all answers. You have a standard CT film with you and you have a PET results too. So if you have done without contrast and some doubt remains and you still need to explore about something anatomical, which you think was missed out because the contrast was not given, then only you need to do a CT separately with the contrast. That's my answer. Thank you, sir. Thank you very just, much. Just now, Dr. Kalash Kudia has sent me an article which they have published just today only, along with Dr. B. R. Mittal in Nuclear Medicine, where they have used PET CT for uh, diagnosing lupus enteritis, which uh, I don't have the details, but probably the clinical diagnosis was uh, tuberculosis. So, yeah. Uh, Dr. Abhinav said that he's joining in a couple of minutes. So, in the meantime, we can have some more discussion on any aspect of uh, uh, tuberculosis. So, I think um, what uh, Dr. Panka said, uh, that is very interesting. And uh, we should reiterate, uh, reiterate that uh, 
the the when when uh, as you asked the question sir about barium uh, mil farutur or barium enterocolysis we say we say uh, ct and um, the the nowadays uh, rarely we are seeing the patient where uh, people who started at it and it was found to be something else later on because probably because of the cross sectional imaging um, other than uh, luminal narrowing you are able to see the wall as a whole and whether there is enhancement and there is nodal disease, what, what is happening to the mesenteric lymph nodes or lymph nodes at other sites. So most probably the, the missing of the diagnosis is probably that's why it, it is gone. And then, uh, then uh, um, uh, one can go for uh, any, any type of um, um, FNA or biopsy based on the location of the lesion. So that point is very, very important. And uh, most probably because of this, this reason, um, and nowadays uh, uh, this uh, barium mill follow through is almost out. So this point is very, very important uh, uh, for the everybody to understand that uh, CT is, uh, CT is uh, definitely a very good investigation uh, mm -hmm. for the abdominal tuberculosis, even whether it is luminal or whether it is uh, um, uh, in the cavity or nodal or solid organ. Yeah, I think if there are any students in the audience, you need to um, understand this and uh, you need to say this also if, when you are asked in the exam because the contrast study, barium or whatever contrast we use, will give you information only about the lumen. Whereas CT tells you about the wall also, it tells you about the extra uh, intestinal, which means peritoneum and lymph nodes also, as Dr. Pankaj uh, showed beautiful images. So that is why... I think uh, I don't remember in the last uh, few years uh, we would have asked for a barium meal or barium meal follow through or a simple enterocolysis or endography. It is always combined with cross sectional uh, imaging, which definitely gives uh, much more information. Uh, we had some uh, discussion about Montu. So, since uh, Mohit, are you still there? I think he has left, so maybe we'll cover it tomorrow because I wanted to ask him about the um, uh, relevance of Montu test, especially in our population where everybody must have been vaccinated. Uh, at least uh, people who are in uh, middle age or elderly and uh, the fact that uh, as many as one third of us are infected with tuberculosis. We may not be having the disease, but we have had the uh, primary infection. So, with, in in view of that, whether the Montu test has any value in diagnosing tuberculosis today? It can work as a support uh, when there is, sir, when there is a very strong possibility and one gets uh, mm -hmm. this uh, highly positive Montu, then that can be indirect uh, support. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I don't think it is uh, in our country at least it can be used as a this thing. I think WHO still recommends doing Montu, if I'm right, you know, some expert can collaborate or not. So when they screen for it. But and, it, is, it is useful in those uh, populations and those areas where tuberculosis is not seen. Because there, yes, of the course, positive yeah. Montu is very helpful. Very, very yes, helpful. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, one of the students had actually asked me in advance whether... We will be talking about children also. So any of the experts would like to say if there are any differences uh, between what we have discussed uh, as far as adults and children are concerned. Are there any differences in clinical presentation, diagnosis? The only point I would like to add is that in children, nodal tuberculosis is, is much, much more common than adults. And uh, that is why they present with either general symptoms or in palpable abdominal mass. Uh, which is because of the nodes. And then the nodes can caseate, they can rupture into the peritoneal cavity, and then a caseating node can have an adherent power loop, which then causes obstruction. So primary GI tuberculosis, proportion-wise, is less common in children as compared to in adults. Uh, Prakash or uh, Piri, any point you would like to add? Uh, uh, not um, um, from my side, sir. We can ask other uh... Dr. Pankaj, Dr. Saurabh, Dr. Prakash, if they want to say something. 
I think I will just like to highlight one point here is that yes, we've yes. been talking about uh, CT a lot in my discussion, but that probably will not hold true when we are talking about uh, the children. Mm -hmm. And we'll try to rely more on ultrasound. Uh, even MR will be challenging to perform in uh, uh, below a certain age group. So I think ultrasound becomes very handy uh, in these uh, group of patients. And uh, I mean, I highlighted that point in my discussion also that uh, I believe ultrasound is, is far underutilized, uh, particularly for bowel tuberculosis. And you see that why should it not be used? If the European countries see a lot of Crohn's disease and they have started using bowel ultrasound, they are, I mean, promoting it to such an extent that now they have started using it as a point of care tool. So there is no reason that we can't use it in uh, TB, which is much more important to us uh, compared to Crohn's disease. And uh, particularly, I mean, definitely in children, uh, ultrasound is a modality. And sometimes even without imaging, as I was trying to say, imaging may not be of paramount importance in children. If you are suspecting them clinically and on examination, you see lymph nodes, uh, then obviously, I mean, in those cases, you take sample from that. And even without imaging, you may be able to treat them. So that is the point. Abhinav, uh, you have sent me a message. He's joining. So we just wait for him. So, Dr. Pankaj, one, uh, one question you said that uh, this thing, uh, the gallbladder tuberculosis, I, I saw one patient uh, uh, pain, pain, gallbladder, this thing, uh, painful uh, um, uh, gallbladder, and we investigated, and there was a CT and whatever investigation would do, it was looking like a carcinoma gallbladder. Um, now, I recall it was a male, and um, uh, symptoms were not that very, uh, systemic symptoms were not very profound. So, we did extended coli. And it came to be a gallbladder tuberculosis. So Dr. Harjit uh, uh, took one one more case we found, and he, uh, Dr. Harjit being first author, we published it. So uh, probably uh, in our country, granulomas, uh, but it, it's I, I I think very difficult to differentiate. Uh, uh, yeah. But uh, there was no 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 stone disease. So that is maybe that is one uh, point where there is no gallstone associated. And probably as uh, uh, nowadays we are trying to do um, uh, color Doppler in a, in, a, in a patient where there is a sludge-like thing, ball-like sludge, and where people mention, and then we go for a color Doppler and try to see whether there is a vessel. So Pankaj, can we, uh, this point, but it is so rare that I don't think it can be uh, added, but what about um, uh, if granuloma of the, of the gall, uh, tuberculosis? Yeah, sir, I think uh, I am not the right person to talk about. I don't have much experience uh, yeah. in terms of uh, <clears throat> diagnosing gallbladder TB. But I mean, in gallbladder, whenever we see a lesion, our tendency is to think about uh, gallbladder cancer. But yes, I mean, uh, if in a odd case we are suspecting something odd, then probably uh, doing uh, aspiration may help. But we usually avoid doing that in, in gallbladder when it seems yeah. to be a susceptible disease. So, I mean, it will be extremely challenging. Yeah. I think we'll move on. Dr. Abhinav has joined. So, Abhinav is uh, an SGPGI uh, product again. Uh, he did his DM from SGPGI. And he is currently the uh, director of uh, gastroenterology services at uh, CK Birla Hospital in Jaipur. Uh, Abhinav is going to talk to us about endoscopic diagnosis of abdominal tuberculosis. Abhinav, uh, if you could uh, finish uh, at about uh, 8.55 because we... Uh, Usually close the master class at nine. Thank you. Yes, sir. So are my slides visible, sir? Yes, yes, sir. yes, yes. So the topic given is uh, to me is uh, endoscopic diagnosis of uh, abdominal tuberculosis, particularly intestinal tuberculosis, because abdominal tuberculosis is a vast topic. This already must have been discussed that 20% of all cases of tuberculosis are extrapulmonary or out of this around 13% are abnormal tuberculosis. Varied presentation, peritonitis, lymphadenopathy, intestinal tuberculosis and sorted organ like pancreas. Now, this is the basically hierarchical approach of diagnosis. We rarely get confirmed diagnosis because positive culture and positive AFB we rarely see. So we have to resort to either possible or uh, probable diagnosis. And uh, when we call it is definitive tuberculosis is when we see growth of microbacterial tuberculosis or histological demonstration of typical AP or necrotizing granuloma. 
and but the problem is poor sensitivity because yield is low around 30 to 50 percent sensitivity we can get at the most so most of the time we have to make presumptive diagnosis based on clinical histological pathological and radiological classic criteria and we are more sure when there is an unequivocal uh, response to ATT over six months and what is the role of uh, colonoscopy endoscopy it is basically not in peritoneal type uh, but generally in gastrointestinal type of tuberculosis uh, we the role of uh, endoscopy is to characterize the lesion to make a presumptive diagnosis and then to obtain a tissue and uh, these are the indian series <coughs> what uh, what are what are the most commonly uh, involved region in intestinal tuberculosis particularly and we all know it is ileocecal region uh, terminal ileum and ascending column which is more frequently involved than other regions uh, now the endoscopic findings depend on the stage of disease when we pick them up and in early stages basically lesions are very mild they are basically can be easily missed like a mild loss of vascular pattern or just an erythema or maybe superficial ulceration so we have to be very careful while doing endoscopy uh, in the patients with uh, chronic symptoms particularly when we are suspecting tuberculosis and we should biopsy them and there is a series where uh, even in normal findings people have picked up uh, tuberculosis uh, if it, they if the biopsy is added to the uh, diagnostic uh, endoscopy. But as the disease advances over years and maybe months or over years, uh, the advanced region might come up, which are deep ulcerations, nodularity, and maybe strictures. So <clears throat> these are the basically typical pet, uh, lesions which we see in uh, uh, for endoscopy or maybe colonoscopy while doing uh, uh, for while, while doing evaluation of uh, intestinal tuberculosis, terminal superficial ulcers. I, or contracted cecum, neurodiffomycival, multiple ulcerations from ICVAL, particularly cecum ascending colon, uh, gaping ICVAL with multiple ulcerations from ICVAL, cecum and ascending colon. These are the kind of lesions we see depending on the uh, stage of the disease. Here again, we can see ulcerated ICVAL, nodular, uh, nodularity and ulceration around a patchulous ICVAL, uh, fixed open ICVAL, and circumferential ulceration. These are the and people have tried to even characterize uh, these patterns into different uh, forms of tuberculosis. Uh, one of them is ulcerative form, where we see multiple ulcerations, and ulceration usually transverse with surrounded nodularity. Then another variety is hypertrophic form, which may present like mass-like mass -like lesion on IC1 with ulceration, and the stricture form, where we have strictures. So <clears throat> these are the most common finding, uh, colonoscopic finding in colonoscopic tuberculosis. Uh, what kind of ulcers we see? Ulcers are usually linear, fissured ulcer. Their orientation is transverse or circumferential, and they are covered with exudate. A surrounding mucosa is usually abnormal with erythema, edema, irregularity, and nodularity. And the most common differential diagnosis when GPT do endoscopy of these patients is with Crohn's disease. So ulcers in Crohn's disease are linear, serpiginous again, but their orientation is longitudinal. Uh, after ulcer are seen in uh, Crohn's, not in ulcerative colitis, and the peculiarity here is intervening mucosa between the ulcer is usually normal, and there will be skipagias. If added with cobalistone appearance in anorectal region, then again suspicion of Crohn's becomes high over tuberculosis. So, <clears throat> what are the what is the data on which these findings are based on? This is an analysis of uh, one of the earlier in 2006 published in endoscopy colonoscope handling. Uh, in the differential diagnosis between intestinal tuberculosis and Crohn's disease, 88 patients equally distributed ileo, uh, ileo, uh, uh, tuberculosis, intestinal tuberculosis with Crohn's disease. And what they found was that features which were suggestive on colonoscopy, which suggested uh, intestinal tuberculosis, a transfer ulcer, patellus IC well, and involvement of less than four segments of uh, colon and scars of pseudopoly. And if there are after ulcers, cobalistone appearance, longitudinal ulcers, and anorectal regions, they, these are the features suggestive of Crohn's disease. And patchulous was with surrounding uh, heaped up folds or destroyed IC1 that again goes in favor of tuberculosis. When they, what they further went, to, went on to give them a score, each of these four and four findings, total eight findings are there, four in favor of tuberculosis, four in favor of Crohn's disease. So for Crohn's disease, they give one point each for each of these findings, and these points were in positive. And for tuberculosis, they have been neg one negative point for each of these findings. And when they compare mean score, 
Crohn's disease patients had total positive score, mean was 1.61, while allosticycle tuberculosis had a negative score, is minus 1.95. And if uh, we apply these features, the accuracy of diagnosis in the, the, that study was 87.5%, which is quite high, quite high. So based on endoscopic feature, we can presumptively make a diagnosis or make up our mind whether this is falling towards Crohn's disease or towards tuberculosis. Now, this is uh, uh, one of the initial Indian studies, World Journal of Gastrology, Dr. Deepa Kamragu Purkar from Mumbai. <coughs> they looked at endoscopic criteria and trying to differentiate Crohn's disease and GI tuberculosis. And they found that deep linear or serpiginous ulcers and cobblestone appearance were in favor of uh, uh, rather than ulcerative colitis. This is another study from AIMS, clinical endoscopic and histological differential between Crohn's disease and ulcerative intestinal tuberculosis. And with respect to intestinal manifestations, features suggestive uh, intestinal tuberculosis was nodularity, while after ulcer, cobblestone, skip area, and linear ulcer, these are suggestive of Crohn's disease as in pre previous studies. Uh, this is a Chinese study, 152 patients. Again, features suggestive of uh, intestinal tuberculosis were ring-like ulcer, means trans, uh, transverse ulcer, or rodent-like ulcer, means deep punched out ulcer, thick and the fixed open IC valve, and particularly if site is cecum or IC valve. While Crohn's disease was suggested when there was longitudinal ulcers, grid-like ulcers, cobblestone appearance, and nodular hyperplasia, with particular predilection for vector sigma. So, based on these research, they, they, they try to differentiate, and this was the result. This is a study from Valor, 60 patients, equally distributed in intestinal tuberculosis and Crohn's disease. Fe they found features suggesting uh, 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 intestinal tuberculosis with ring like ulcers, rodent like ulcer, and fixed open IC valve, similar to the Chinese study. While longitudinal ulcers, skip lesions, and higher number of polyunic segment involvement was suggestive of uh, Crohn's disease. So, this findings of this study was similar to the Chinese study. Now, what are rodent-like ulcers? These are deep punched out circumstitial ulcers, uh, as seen here in the picture A. Ring-like ulcers are transfer ulcers. These are uh, seen as, uh, as we can see in panel B. Now, this is a particular finding which is very specific. Fixed open IC valve means I, the, the fixity shows scarring. Uh, uh, fibrosis and uh, fixed open IC valve is close in favor of uh, tuberculosis. Now these are the these are the picture the pictures of transverse ulcers and mass-like lesions seen in hypertrophic uh, ulcerative and hypertrophic form of ulcerative tuberculosis. Now these are the typical lesions of Crohn's disease. We can see the ulcer go into longitudinal extent here in both of the pictures. These are after ulceration on the left, <clears throat> which is quite characteristic of uh, Crohn's disease. And if we see internal fissionally, uh, as we see here in uh, uh, the, the picture on the right side, this goes more in favor of Crohn's disease. And this is classical cobblestone appearance in Crohn's disease. Now, these are the individual study, but now this we can go refer to this uh, meta analysis, which included 12 study around thousand of patient. Uh, around 600 of tuberculosis, around 500 of Crohn's disease. What they found from this meta-analysis is that transfer ulcer and petulous IC valve. They are, these are the features suggested to alien uh, intestinal tuberculosis. Sensitivity is not that great, but specificity is quite high. And features suggestive of Crohn's disease were after ulcer, Crohn's disease, skip lesion, and non longitudinal ulcer. So again, further confirmation of uh, this reaffirmation of findings of previous studies. Now, this is another meta-analysis on which they uh, used the Bayesian statistical model for differentiating intestinal tuberculosis from Crohn's disease, published uh, in American Journal of Gastroenterology 2017. Number of study was more as compared to previous meta-analysis. More than 3,000 patients, around uh, 3,700 patients were included, good sample size. And what they found is that the features there in red, they, uh, these features favored intestinal tuberculosis and features which are labeled here in teal uh, blue, they favor Crohn's disease. So transfer ulcers in petulous IC valve goes in favor of tuberculosis, while longitudinal ulcer, aphthous ulcer, cobblestone appearance, 
uh, skip legions, you know, they, they, they go in favor of Crohn's disease. So, other than uh, uh, looking, just going by, just by appearance, what else we can do? We can do take a biopsy. So, how much uh, is the number of biopsy we should take? Three, four, five, six, seven, or eight. So, this is the study from India, from Mumbai group, 182 patient. Uh, they from, uh, took biopsy and performed culture on MGI, which is a, uh, one of the uh, advanced culture method. Uh, what they saw from the study is that taking eight biopsy instead of four biopsy increased positivity of culture from 40 to 52 percent. So the, from the study, the author concluded that we should take eight biopsy pieces if we suspect tuberculosis and if we were intend to do culture for mycobacterium. ICOMR also uh, um, published a worksheet uh, for diagnosis of tuberculosis and their recommendation is at least six biopsies should be taken in sterile saline for microbiological testing, which includes culture. Now, what are the positivity rate on intestinal tissue? Why advanced culture method? Because culture method, the, the, the yield uh, uh, depends on the type of culture method we include. In general, culture method varies from 7 to 79%. Mean, mean is 50%, but advanced culture may, methods may give more yield. So we should always go for advanced culture method or nucleic acid amplification test or PCR gaze test. Now, a word about endoscopic ultrasound. This is done for basically sampling lymph node or sampling some mucosal lesions which are missed by endoscopic biopsies. So, what is the diagnostic? This is from SGPGI. A uh, good number of patients, 31 patients were diagnosed with tuberculosis. They did gene expert uh, to diagnose uh, tuberculosis, and their positivity rate of USA FNA and uh, gene expert was 97%. So, these are the lymph node, periportal, subcanina, subperipancreatic, ciliar, and periesophageal lymph node which they sampled, and these are the various. Test which they do, uh, did on the FNA aspirates. So, gene expert had highest these 97%, cytology 77%, smear uh, didn't uh, do very well, around 39%, and conventional culture, culture fared least around 30%, uh, 13%. So, gene experts gave good game. Now, this is my uh, last slide to summarize. The endoscopy plays important role in diagnosis uh, intestinal tuberculosis. Identification of pattern involvement game may give clue to diagnosis. The uh, intestinal tuberculosis patient tend to have transverse ulcer in patchular IC wall, confirmed with various study and meta-analysis. The endoscopy helps in tissue acquisition. The recommendation of biopsy is at least six to eight more the merrier. And US FNA lymph node, if we are doing, we should go for gene expert to detect uh, mycobacteria. Thank you so much. So yes. thank you. I finished on time, sir. Uh, thank you, Dr. Abhinav, um, uh, for finishing on time because uh, we were, uh, sir, finishes uh, absolutely uh, up, uh, at nine. Uh, we have uh, two, three minutes. Uh, so um, uh, one of the important message you have tried to give that um, uh, FNA can have, you can have a gram, uh, we can have a uh, tissue which can be used for the gene expert. And we can understand that this particular a uh, thing my might be resistant to the uh, uh, routine uh, ATT. So yes. that that point is very, very important. And uh, other than I think all our points have been covered. So we can, uh, uh, um, Kapoor sir, if you want to say something, mm -hmm. we can uh, ask any other comment by any question by anybody or any other comment, anything we are not seeing in the chat box. No. Not really, but uh, I think endoscopy plays a very important role because now a large part of the GI tract can be accessed endoscopically, uh, definitely for biopsy and some areas at least for visualization. And the features which Dr. Rabinav described to a great extent can at least suggest, if not diagnosed, that we may be dealing with tuberculosis. Of course, as has been emphasized earlier, the point which Dr. Sitaram mentioned that uh, in all these cases, a tissue diagnosis, whether of tuberculosis or of some other disease like malignancy, is very important. Uh, and there is very little place in very highly selected cases after careful thought of a therapeutic trial, uh, which should not delay the treatment of uh, other diseases, especially malignancy, which is a great mimic. So I think we will continue our um, discussion tomorrow, mainly for uh, 
management of tuberculosis. And for today, again, on my behalf and Dr. Yadav's behalf, I would like to thank uh, Prakash Sasmal, Saurabh Galoda, Pankaj, and uh, Abhinav. Abhinav, thank, thank you, you uh, thank for you. Uh, joining. And uh, Abhinav has contributed earlier to several uh, master classes, and I am sure uh, we will continue to have him. Uh, so with that, I think we will close uh, dot at nine o'clock. And uh, I kept seeing in between about uh, at a given point in time, more than 30 people were watching live. But as I have been watching earlier, uh, these videos of master classes, which are uploaded on uh, YouTube by Dr. Avinash Tank's uh, technical team in Ahmedabad. Avinash is again a SGPGI fellow. Uh, they are watched by a large number of people later. Uh, both students and practicing surgeons. So I think uh, the efforts which you all are putting in in contributing to these master classes is not going down the drain. It's not a waste. It is being used by students and surgeons. And I feel that even if one uh, student can pass in the exam or one uh, physician or surgeon can treat a patient properly uh, after a master class, the effort is uh, worth it. Uh, so with that, uh, thank you all and uh, have a good night and. Uh, we will close and meet again at uh, 7. You.